faithful and just to forgive. Justice has come over on the side of the Christian because Jesus Christ is on the side of the Christian. So if you confess your sins, God will put them away, and you will be delivered. God's Faithfulness to the Tempted God is also faithful to the tempted. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 tells us, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. The faithfulness of God is operating to deliver us also from the temptations that bother us. Some poor suffering Christians say, I feel all boxed in, as if there was a wall all around me. Someone has pointed out that when you can't escape to the right, the left, forward, or backward, you can always go up. God's faithfulness is the way out, because it's the way up. You can be sure of that. Your temptation is common to everybody. If you're on the borderline of the victorious life and you say, under the circumstances in which I live, I just can't make it, Remember, God says your temptation is common to all. My father was a tough English farmer. I was proud of the strength of my father, but when he got a cold, he became the biggest baby in the world. He would say that nobody ever had a cold like his. My poor little old German mother could get so sick that she would go limping around, pale and tired out, yet she had to keep going. But when my big tough father got sick, he laid down and called for her, and she had to wait on him. He thought that the kind of cold he got was unique, but it was just a cold in his nose. Likewise, we think we're tempted above all others. We should remember, however, that there have been saints that have crossed the briar patch where we are now, and they got out all right. If we believe God, we'll make it too. Some men have wives that are wild cats, difficult to get along with, and they think they are tempted above all others. John Wesley was married to a wild cat, and she didn't even have her claws trimmed. But God got John Wesley through all right. He used to kneel down and pray in Latin so his wife wouldn't be able to know what he was saying. And while he prayed, she threw old shoes at his head. Not a very nice family affair, but that's the way they got on. The time came when Wesley said goodbye to his wife and went off preaching, even though she didn't want him to. And they never did get together much after that, though he saw to it that she was taken care of. She stayed home and grumbled as he went out everywhere preaching the gospel and transforming England. Then one day he was riding along on his horse, meditating or praying, looking up in the sky. Someone rode up alongside him and said, Mr. Wesley, your wife is dead. And he looked down and said, Oh, she died, did she? And he went back to looking up. Wesley got along all right, in spite of the wife he had. There are also some dear women who love God with all their heart, but are married to slobs, men who refuse to be anything else but carnal, vulgar, and more or less not what their wives had hoped for. These women think there's nobody stuck the way I am. I knew a godly praying woman whose husband, God bless him, was a drunkard. His stomach wouldn't hold down his food, so he used to come home with his clothes dirty clear to his feet. I'm afraid I know what I would have done to him, but she didn't. She prayed, cleaned him off, and put him to bed. When he woke up the next morning with a hangover, he'd promise her anything, but then he'd go out again with the boys and come home swaying from side to side, covered with filth and she'd go through the same thing all over again. She prayed for years for that man. I don't know how the poor woman ever endured it, but she prayed on. She was one of those happy Christians, a little wisp of a woman. One day her drunken husband came to church, came down front, got down on his knees, and bawled like a drunkard bawls, half self-pity, half something else. But God saved him. He became a model Christian and lived for God for some years afterward. And she walked around just as proud of him as an eagle that had hatched another. She'd brought him to God, hatched that fellow out by prayer and patience. 
I suppose there were times when she heard him snoring in the corner in his drunken sleep and wished she'd never met him. And I suppose there were times when she used to pity herself and say, God, how do you expect me to hang on? But God whispered in her heart, Temptations are common to all, but I'm faithful. I won't let you down. The result was that not only did he get converted, but also a lot of the members of the family. And they'll be in heaven with their parents one of these days. It just shows that when God says that he is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, he means exactly that. God's Faithfulness to Strugglers Are you an anxious and fearful person who just can't believe that everything is all right between you and God? Listen to what God has to say to you. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. Isaiah chapter 54 verses 7 through 9 It was a great day in my life when I believed God about this. I believe that though God may have to correct me and chasten me, he will never be angry with me again. For Jesus Christ's sake, for his promise's sake, and for his faithfulness' sake. He has sworn that he will not be wroth with me, nor rebuke me. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Chapter 54, verse 10. That is his word to the anxious. Then there's the Christian who may have been unfaithful to the Lord through the years. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Then there's the discouraged person. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. You may have been serving God quite a while, but instead of getting better, you feel you're getting worse. You know what's happening to you? You're getting to know yourself better. There was a time when you didn't know who you were and you thought you were pretty fine. Then, by the good grace of God, He showed you yourself and it was shocking and disappointing to you. But don't be discouraged, because He is faithful that calls you, and He will also do it. God will finish the job. I've often wondered how a hen must feel about sitting for three weeks on an egg. My mother always put thirteen eggs under a hen, and the old girl would sit right there. She might take a little coffee break once in a while, but back she'd come again to the nest. For the first week it was a novelty. Two weeks of it she might endure, but that last week must have been torture, just sitting there with nothing happening. Then about noon of the twenty-first day, the first little experimental peep is heard under her wings, and she smiles as only a hen can smile and says, Thank God they're here! After that it's just a question of time. One after the other the chicks peck themselves out of their shells. I used to get down on my hands and knees as a boy and watch them picking themselves out. They're messy when they first appear, but give them about ten minutes in the sunshine and they're fluffy as can be, and lovely to look at. But they only come after twenty-one long days of waiting. God sometimes makes us wait. He made the disciples wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 4 And He may make you wait. But remember, God is faithful who called you, and He also will do it. This is our faithful God. I recommend to you that you withdraw your hope from a changing, treacherous, and false world and put your trust in Jesus Christ. He is faithful who also will do it. Father, help us to believe. Forgive us for doubting. Take away our unbelief, our diffidence, our slowness to believe. Help us now to put our trust in Thee and throw ourselves upon Thee with all the trust of a child in the hands of his father. May we now trust Thee. We pray now for the discouraged, for the sinner, for the Christian who has failed Thee, 
for those who are on the borderline of despair and who are living under circumstances that are very hard to bear. Thou, O God, art faithful and will not allow us to fail. Thou wilt keep us and hold us up and bless us. Now greatly lift us and help us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Chapter 10 God's Love Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. The love of God is the hardest of all his attributes to speak about. You may not understand God's love for us. I don't know that I do myself. We are trying to comprehend the incomprehensible. It is like trying to take the ocean in your arms or embrace the atmosphere or rise to the stars. No one can do it, so I suppose I must do the best I can and trust the Holy Spirit to make up for human lack. The text above says God is love, but this is not a definition of God. It is most important to understand this. There are a great many crackpot poets and religious people that are saying that God is love, so love is God, and therefore all is love, and all is God. These people are busy and happy for the time being, but they're also very, very confused in their theology. When the Scripture says God is love, it is not defining God. It does not tell us what God is in His metaphysical being. In the first place, the Bible never tells us what God is in His deep, essential being. No one can conceive what God is except God, because God is inconceivable. Even if anyone could conceive it, it couldn't be expressed because God is ineffable. And if it could be expressed, it couldn't be understood because God is incomprehensible. Therefore, to equate love with God is to go way off in your theology. If God is love and His metaphysical being, then God and love are equal to each other, identical. We could worship love as God. Thus, we would be worshiping an attribute of personality and not the person himself, thereby destroying the concept of personality in God and denying in one sweep all the other attributes of the deity. Don't forget that it also says, God is light, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, and this is the true God and eternal life. Chapter 5, verse 20. But we don't try to limit his nature to just light or life. When it says God is love, it means that love is an essential attribute of God's being. It means that in God is the summation of all love, so that all love comes from God. 
and it means that God's love, we might say, conditions all of his other attributes, so that God can do nothing except he does it in love. I believe that at the end of time, when we know as we are known, see 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, it will be found that even the damning of a man is an expression of the love of God as certainly as the redeeming of a man. God cannot separate himself into parts and do with one attribute one thing and with another another. All that God is determines all that God does. So when God redeems a man in love or damns another man in justice, he's not contradicting himself. But justice and love are working together in the unitary being of God. What we mean when we say God is love is what we mean when we say of a man, he is kindness itself. We don't mean that kindness and the man are equated and identical, but we mean the man is so kind that kindness is all over him and conditions everything he does. So when we say God is love, we mean that God's love is such that it permeates his essential being and conditions all that he does. Nothing God ever does or ever did or ever will do is done separate from the love of God. When I look at what love is, it reminds me of something my dear friend Max Wright, the son of a rabbi, an Oxford graduate and a great saint, said. I said to him one time, Dr. Wright, what do you think of Rotterham's work on the Psalms? Brother Tozer, he said, Rotterham botanizes the Psalms. A botanist takes a flower and pulls it apart to analyze and name the parts. When he is through, you do not have a flower, you have botany. Rotterham takes the psalms and analyzes, classifies, breaks down, and pulls apart. When he's through, you do not have David's psalms anymore. You have theology. I thought that was pretty good. But now I feel a little self-conscious when I try to preach on the love of God. I'm concerned that I may be botanizing, tearing the petals off to find out what they are. But I'll be careful to put them back together so that you won't go away with a petal and think you have the whole garden. Love is good will. First of all, love is the principle of good will. The angels sang good will toward men, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Love always wills the good of its object and never wills any harm to its object. If you love somebody, really love him, you'll want to be good to him and to do good to him. You'll never want any harm to come to him if you can help it. That's why John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 If I know a man loves me, I'm not afraid of him. If I'm not sure he does, I may be a bit cagey around him. Love casts out fear, for when we know we are loved, we are not afraid. Whoever has God's perfect love... Fear is gone out of the universe for him. All real fear goes when we know that God loves us because fear comes when we're in the hands of someone who does not will our good. A little boy lost in a department store will stand in a paroxysm of hysterical fear. People's faces are strange, even those who want to be kind. The child is afraid that he may be in the hands of somebody who wills him harm. But when he sees the familiar face of his mother, he runs sobbing to her and climbs into her arms. He's never afraid in the hands of his mother because experience has taught him that mother wills his good. Perfect love casts out his fear. When the mother is not there, fear fills the little child's heart. But mother's kind, smiling, eager face drives out fear. We are born into a world where there are a great many things against us. Sin, Satan, accidents, and many other things. If we're in the hands of accidents, of the devil, of sin, we have something to be afraid of. People have written books on how to conquer fear. I think they're as ridiculous as can be. They advise you to sit down and tell yourself, Now there's nothing to be afraid of. The sky smiles upon you. The wind is yours and also the sun. And about that time you tumble over with a heart attack, or you're stricken with some disease, or you get a telegram that your son was killed in an auto accident, or somebody declares war on somebody else. It's ridiculous simply to say, don't be afraid. A man sitting on a railroad track can tell himself there is nothing to be afraid of, but five minutes later they'll be picking him up in a basket. 
Of course there's something to be afraid of. If you believe you're in the hands of chance, of course there's something to be afraid of, and you're a fool if you're not afraid. If you're an unrepentant sinner, and it seems as if a sword hangs over your head, of course there's something to be afraid of. If you've sinned against God and not repented, there's a certain fearful looking for of judgment. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27. And it is right and natural that there should be. But when through the open door of the cross and the name and power of Jesus Christ I commend myself to the Father's heart, then God cancels all my past, accepts all my present, swears his holy name for all my future, and the love of God takes me over. Then fear goes out of my heart, because love has come in. I am no longer in the hands of men. I said years ago at a denominational convention, I am not in the hands of these delegates. They can't elect me and they can't kick me down. They can't put me in and they can't put me out. Later another pastor came up to me and said, You'd be surprised how fast they could. But the truth is, they can't. I'm in the hands of God, and I appeal not to delegates or any other human, but to the Most High God. God is my friend through Jesus Christ, and He wants me to prosper. Therefore I am not afraid. I put myself in His hands without fear. Love casts out fear. Love is the principle of good will, and God wants to be our friend. Love is emotional. Love is also an emotional fixation. That is, it identifies itself emotionally with its object. This may sound a little silly, but have you ever noticed that if you truly love somebody, you even love their clothes? The poet Ben Jonson wrote verses about a sash that his sweetheart wore. If you're a dignified old man, you may laugh at that, but the fact is there was a day when you too had butterflies in your heart and just the sight of her handwriting was enough to set you off for the day. We also love our children, and we will their good. I think about our young daughter. She'll be twenty-two this summer, but she's still our little girl. If she had some deadly disease and I could save her with a blood transfusion, a blood transfusion that would kill me, I wouldn't even hesitate a second. I'm no hero, I'm just a father, that's all. Love emotionally identifies itself with its object. If I knew that she lay at the point of death in a hospital and that giving her my blood would make her live many years and let me die, I'd do it in a second. I'd lie down there with a smile. Any father who loves his children would. Love always identifies emotionally with its object. Have you ever seen a thin wisp of a young mother staggering around with a big fat baby? The mother is literally being nursed to death. The baby is getting fat and happy while the mother is really suffering under it. And yet does that mother complain? Not at all. She looks down into that little face and loves it, and would give twice that, ten times that, because she has already identified herself emotionally with that baby. Why was it that between Calvary and the Resurrection, Peter, John, Bartholomew, and the disciples were walking around eating, drinking, and sleeping, alive and healthy, while Jesus was dead and in the tomb? Because he had identified himself emotionally with those disciples, and with those he called the world. Dying for them was not a hard task. That's why I never care for mournful songs that portray Jesus weeping on his own shoulder and saying, Oh, what a hero I was, and you don't appreciate it. Too bad for me. Songs like that are not healthy. They're written by men who need psychiatric treatment. Jesus Christ never went to his disciples and said, Now look, I died for you. Won't you remember my sufferings and my tears and my groans and my blood? Never. He said, Mary, and Mary turned and said, Rabboni. John chapter 20, verse 16. He never said, I died for you. He said simply, Mary. That's the difference between the New Testament and a lot of religious books. Religious books are often unhealthy, and in an effort to become spiritual, they become more unhealthy still. I want to be a healthy Christian. I believe it is the will of God that we should be healthy-minded. The healthiest man was Jesus Christ, and the healthiest disciple was Paul. We ought to be healthy men and women.
That's why I don't go in much for Good Friday services where they sit around moaning and groaning, trying to follow Jesus through the stations of the cross. It is like trying to follow one's mother through the long hours of labor. It's enough to say, Thank you, Mother, I'm here. A woman giving birth, Jesus said, Remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Chapter 16, verse 21. If she's healthy-minded. If she isn't, she writes poetry and cries on her own shoulder. She has to go to a doctor and have her head examined. But if she's healthy, she emotionally identifies with her child. Whatever prospers her child prospers her. Whatever hurts her child hurts her. God was so emotionally identified with the human race that the devil knew the only way he could get at God was through the human race. Milton understood this when he wrote Paradise Lost. This classic is not inspired scripture, and there's much of it that isn't scriptural at all. But at its center, it is quite scriptural, and Milton was theologian enough to know it. In Paradise Lost, Milton pictured the devil plotting with his horrible demons how they could get at God. We've been licked outright, and there's nothing we can do, the demons said. I'm paraphrasing here, of course. God's mighty engines have thundered, and we're done for. We can never hope to take God's throne by storm. What will we do? Well, the devil, being the devil, said, I think I've got it. There's some talk about how God is going to create a people that will be after his image and like him. He loves them more than anything else in his universe. If I can get to them and ruin them, I will hurt God worse than if I'd overthrown his very dominion. So he hunted down Adam and Eve and began to tempt them. And when he brought about the fall of the human race, he caused injury to the heart of God, because God loved the human race, made in his own image. Our sins are an emotional wound in the heart of God. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, quoting from Psalm 8, verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him? The Greek word for mindful means fixture in the mind. We're a fixture in God's mind. And the only wonderful, strange eccentricity of the great free God is that he allows himself to be emotionally identified with me, so whatever hurts me hurts him. Whenever I'm in pain, God is in pain. Whenever I suffer, he suffers. Scripture says, The Lord wilt make all our bed in our sickness. Psalm 41, verse 3. God sits beside us and grieves when we grieve. Love also feels pleasure in its object. God is happy in his love. When people love each other, they're very happy. When he was president of the U.S., Woodrow Wilson fell in love with the widow, Mrs. Galt. Wilson, you may remember, was a dignified old fellow with a long face and a pair of thick glasses. He had been a professor and a college president, and he looked the part. He was so dignified that it was a production just to clear his throat. But one summer he met Mrs. Galt, and she bowled him over, and he said, Well, I'm going to get married. And then he jumped up and did a little dance around the presidential floor. Imagine a president doing a thing like that. What had happened to the old man? Love had come. He thought that the snow on his roof meant the fire had gone out in the furnace, but there was still some emotion there, and he was happy to find it. Love always makes people happy. A young mother is always happy over her baby. I've never seen one that wasn't. Sometimes a mother may get a little angry when the child gets big enough to push things over, but for the most part, love is a pleasurable thing, and God is happy in his love toward all that he has made. I've just been reading again the early chapters of Genesis, and there's no escaping the fact that God felt pleasure in his creation. God made light, shook his head, and said, That's good. He liked that. Then he made the dry land to appear and put the seas in one place and said, That's good. Then he made the sun, the stars, and moon to rule the night and day and said, That's good. Then he made man and said, That's very good. See Genesis chapter 1. God was an artist, and every time he finished a painting, he shook his head and said, That's good. God loved it. He was pleased with what he was doing, and that's the kind of God I preach. Not a faraway, dehydrated, sour, sulky God hiding in some imperial palace. I preach a friendly God who is happy in his work. It is only sin that has brought the curse, the pain, and the grief. 
and he has sent his son to deal with that sin business too. God makes delightful reference to his works and to everything that he has made. It says in Psalm 104, verse 31, The Lord shall...